Good afternoon, everyone. I think it's been a long two days, so I'm trying to make sure I don't keep you here for too long. That being said, uh, thanks first and foremost for inviting myself and Grab to help share our points of view on how we believe Southeast Asia as a region can actually come back stronger post this very difficult times called COVID. Um, first things first, I hope you can see me, because when I was packing for this trip, I had no idea I was actually going to blend into the background, but I guess that's what you call on brand. Um, and also, thank you for laughing, because that was objective number one for today's presentation. But on to more serious stuff. Um, I think we all know that COVID was one of the most devastating events of our times and of our generation and lives. At the same time, I think it came with silver linings. And one of them was that digitalization was accelerated. And what did this mean for Southeast Asia? First things first, uh, according to stats from the US, uh, UN's ITC, internet penetration accelerated drastically during this period. In the first year of COVID, basically, 10% of the world got additional um, internet access. And in Southeast Asia, this translated into 80 million net new internet users in 2020 and 2021. That brought, finally, our internet penetration to 75%. So these are all very, very drastic changes that happened just in a matter of two years. Now, as we have been operating in eight countries, 480 cities here in this region we call home. We've had frontline seats in seeing how this has impacted the region, and more importantly, frontline seats in helping to drive this change positively as well. And during this period, we had the fortune of working with many Southeast Asian governments in trying to figure out how we could bring more individuals and small businesses online, not just to survive, but also thrive. For example, in Thailand here, we worked with the Thai government, where we were able to help connect thousands of farmers that suddenly lost their ability to export or sell their goods because of the COVID restrictions. We brought them on the onto the Grab platform and connected them directly to millions of users. We are honored that we have been able to, together with these, 5 million driver partners that we have online, as well as 4 million merchant partners, we're now able to serve 1 in 20 Southeast Asians in this region on this digital journey. So over the course of this year, Southeast Asia has been shifting into finding its post-pandemic footing. And we have seen that some of the most direct impact that the COVID restrictions have had have effectively reversed whether it's movement or travel restrictions, thankfully that is over. But the deeper consequences of this pandemic are now on us, where acute income inequality is going to cast a very long shadow upon our societies if we don't do something about it. So for today's session, I would like to cover three areas that I believe will help not only just alleviate this disparity, but also hopefully build a brighter future. So first things first, we believe very strongly that we need to empower MSMEs, micro, small, medium entrepreneurs. Why this particular group? In Southeast Asia, ADB estimates that more than 90% of all businesses in this region are actually MSMEs. Not only do they drive our economy, but they also employ more than two thirds of the working population. So ensuring that this group is healthy is critical for the future of Southeast Asia. But what do these MSMEs face as challenges in this digital journey? Many are late adopters because they lack the awareness, knowledge, have unequal access to digital tools and also financial constraints in joining this journey. But what we were able to see during COVID was a very strong push collectively in the region to help address many of these barriers to bring this group online. 
So our next challenge together is to ensure that we do not regress on the momentum that we have built, but more importantly, build on top of it. So, while we are bringing them online, that has been a critical first step. But we have realized that first step is not enough because we need to enable them with the tools and capabilities to also thrive online. Be it data and consumer insights that will, let's say, let a merchant figure out which kind of foods and menu items are actually more amen amenable to their eaters, or whether or not they should be stocking their pantry with different types of um, supplies, those are all insights that previously were not available to MSMEs due to the lack of availability and accessibility of these digital tools. Additionally, we know that this is really important for the developing markets where helping them to develop more systematic tracking of their transactions and their sales is actually giving them access to building up credit scores that they didn't have before, which are critical to enabling them to get access to new microloans that will also continue on the virtual cycle, uh, virtual cycle of growth. And the best way for me to illustrate this is to share a story of one of our amazing merchants on the Grab platform. So Filza, she's an owner of Gurai Ninik Obik, a traditional Malay food stall in Singapore, in Geelong Market. And she loves telling this story where she shared that during COVID, like many, many, many businesses that were unfortunately affected, everything came to a standstill for her. But because of that situation, she decided to give Grab a try. This digital marketplace that she thought, you know, was too cool for her generation. She came online. And as part of that, we were able to help her figure out how to drive additional net new sales via self-serve ads and marketing tools. We were able to essentially give her a new digital business in a box because suddenly she had a web presence, access to millions of users, access to a delivery supply network that she otherwise would have had to hire on her own. Many other digital tools and capabilities that suddenly were in her reach. And from that, she was able to not only just survive COVID, she was able to triple her sales in less than three months. So stories like these are why we continue doing what we're doing. Because there are millions more entrepreneurs and small business owners like Filza who are just eager and waiting to harness the capabilities that were previously not available to them. And we believe by equipping them, we not only help them thrive and survive in this new economy, but we also help create ripple effects in many different ways for the rest of Southeast Asia and this region we call home. So that is bucket number one. What is bucket number two? This is a personal passion for mine, of mine because it's about creating and developing hyperlocal technologies. So in our limited experience, we have found that whenever we go to find plug and play available global technologies uh, that are sold by other com technology companies for our use in Southeast Asia, they tend to work, but they tend not to be tailored to our very unique needs. So ultimately, they will hit some scalability cap at some point in time. And I'll give you an example of that, which I hope all of us in Bangkok here are most familiar with. Mapping. So in Southeast Asia and developed markets, you know that you know, whichever map that you use, oftentimes many of the small alleyways are oftentimes missing. But if you were to just go there and observe it, those are actually the routes that the locals use and need the most. Right? That's one. In Bangkok in itself, a big city as well, we have a different set of challenges, right? Go to Central World or Retropassong, right? And you'll probably get extremely confused on where to get picked up. And by the way, our drivers and passengers experience this all day long, right? 
So because of challenges like this that we were facing over the last few years, we decided to make a huge investment into developing our own geo and mapping capabilities. And we were able to do this because we had a unique set of assets and technology know-how, which was very specific to the region. Specifically, we had access to the largest driver network in the region. So because of that, we were able to create capabilities and toolings that enable community mapping to become a real thing. And as we know, the local communities know Southeast Asia the best, and ultimately, we ended up creating maps that were most tailored and relevant to the users here. Over the last few years, this has translated into us mapping more than 800,000 kilometers of roads and 33 million POIs. And more importantly for us, when we compare our capabilities to other global available products, not only have we found them to be more accurate, we've also found them to be more cost effective. And why is this a personal passion for mine, of mine? It's because I think there is so much opportunity left on the table for us to create more localized technologies that are specific to the needs of the 600 million people here in this region. And I look forward to the opportunity where more and more of these technologies can be shown to the world where Southeast Asian technologies become world-class technologies. As an example, Grab Maps has now launched us an enterprise solution and where we are actually used by not just other local players, but also global players uh, throughout the world. So that's bucket number two. Last bucket. Um, and I don't think this will be a net new topic, but something that, uh, of course, I think many of us believe passionately about. The future of the region ultimately will be driven by the talent of this region. And this is something that we strongly believe because education is ultimately the bedrock of every thriving society. And seven years ago, how this manifested for us was when we had to make a very difficult and big decision on where do we continue or start to invest our technology R&D capabilities into. Do we do it here locally or do we do what everybody else was doing, which is building R&D centers in the States? or India or China. When we asked around for advice, everybody, both local and global players, told us, don't set up shop in, in Southeast Asia. The talent is neither wide or deep enough. But we're stubborn. Anthony, my co-founder, and I uh, tend to often not listen to the advice that we get. So we ended up developing and, and investing into R&D centers here in the region. More importantly is why. Because we strongly believed if we didn't start to help break the chicken and it problem, this would maintain to be a continued vicious cycle for the region. And thankfully, that bet paid off. Because as of now, half of our R&D centers globally are actually based in Southeast Asia. Specifically, Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Vietnam. And building these capabilities have not been easy. Right? It's taken many, many years of investment, many, many years of mistakes and iterations, but we are now confident that the talent that we have locally are truly world-class talent. Now, beyond building tech capabilities, we also believe that we need to support various initiatives to help educate the next generation. And this is where initiatives for us, like the Grab for Good Fund, where we have committed to um, provide scholarships and bursaries for more than 2,000 underprivileged students, are critical for us. In addition to that, it's not just university students, uh, we have an initiative called Grab Campus as well which focuses on tertiary students who are getting ready for their first jobs in the working world. Mentorship, coaching, training, support, all of this are going to be continued efforts that I think all of we need to continue supporting to enable that bright 
young future to take forward and drive us forward. In closing, we have survived one of the greatest tests of our time. And with this test came silver linings, such as the acceleration of digitalization. It has been a powerful enabler. The thing that has enabled us to still get food despite lockdowns, right? But despite this, we need to make sure that all the progress and momentum that we have created does not regress and ultimately accelerates from here on upwards. As we step into the post-COVID world, we need to make sure this progress is equally broadly and sustainably distributed because inequality is something we all need to fight against. So these knock-on effects, we believe can be alleviated via three key areas and efforts. As I mentioned, focusing on empowering our MSMEs with better tools. Secondly, developing hyperlocal technologies that we can all be proud of. And thirdly, investing into homegrown talent that will take us forward into the future. For us to successfully execute on this, as we all know from many conversations to date and many efforts to date, no one can do this alone, so we need to work hand in hand. Private, public institutions, governments, tech companies, educational institutions. Ultimately, the future is bright if we can continue to put behind the same focus and momentum and resources that we have done to take us past these dark times and move us forward into a future of resilient recovery and growth for Southeast Asia. Thank you, folks. Thank you very much. We're nearly at the end. <laughs> um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. We're going to try and channel Ling's uh, optimism and positivity to take us through uh, as we close out. And it is a real honour to be joined by a titan of banking, Pyong. Um, just let's start, let's start with a vision of the future. Let's start with something optimistic. Um, I know digital transformation, you've said, is a core part of how you think about your business and you think about the future of your business. What is the number one priority for you for the next 12 months when it comes to digital infrastructure and building a better sort of financially inclusive environment? Well, first of all, thank you, Rebecca. And um, it's now you and me before the <laughs> session ends, right? Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, when you talk about digital transformation, uh, it is unavoidable. Uh, 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 journey for every um, participant. Um, we are in the, uh, even before the pandemic, I think we are in the, um, um, in the era of uh, industrial revolution 4.0, and it means uh, digital disruption. And uh, when that happens, uh, uh, follow on by pandemics, follow on by geopolitical risk, uh, what it means is it accelerates the, um, uh, 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 the way into the future economy, the way people do things. So therefore, the transformation or digital transformation uh, will be even faster, and you have to be uh, 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 driving toward a, 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 a such the, uh, um, um, uh, the end game, which you don't know what it's going to be like. But you have to ensure that the, uh, the foundation, the structure, the framework is ready uh, and be resilient enough to get there. And when you talk about the um, uh, digital transformation, um, you have to understand what it means for each organization. And in our case, uh, or in our industry, we talk about efficiency, uh, we talk about the, uh, the inclusion, we talk about being relevant uh, to our clients, to our society, uh, uh, toward the new economy. So therefore, uh, our objective uh, is to ensure that in the transition toward the new economy, uh, we remain not only relevant, but we ensure that 
um, um, stakeholders around us uh, uh, will continue to um, uh, to be empowered uh, by us uh, 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 with an objective of uh, uh, having a better life, having a better operations, having a, 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 a better uh, partnership, so on and so forth. Can you talk a bit about what you mean by building a resilient framework? What does that mean in practical, real terms, and what are you prioritizing? Well, first of all, in the, in the um, highly uncertain uh, 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 world, um, uncertainty is high. So you have to be very, very flexible um, um, to adopt, adjust along the way. And um, along the, uh, uh, in, in that path, you have to ensure that the infrastructure and the environment that you operate uh, 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 allow you to, 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 to be so. And that means that you have to um, um, relook at your infrastructure, your operating environment, uh, your, your backbone infrastructure, uh, uh, and ensure that it will allow you to first being uh, not only cost efficient, but also be uh, able to adjust to the changes that you may see along the way in a very rapidly manner. And at your bank, what are some of the biggest or maybe the biggest challenge that you think we face when it comes to building out some of that robust, resilient infrastructure? Um, I would say there are a few things. First, you have to connect the dots, right? And connecting the dots mean that you have to be uh, uh, picking uh, uh, the ecosystem that you want to be in uh, to start with. And to be in the ecosystem uh, in the new world for banking services, I would say banking is not going to be a primary objective of, of people's life, uh, will not be a primary objective of the business. Uh, they want to do the business and, and, and money and banking and services uh, will facilitate that, but it is not the main objective. So you have to pick the pocket of expertise in order to understand uh, uh, the journey, you have to understand in depth the ecosystem and be able to embed uh, your product and services into that journey of the selected ecosystem. So, so that, that will have to be uh, something that you have to, uh, uh, to ensure that it, it happens. And talking about banking as a facilitator, um, one of your landmark platforms here is Paotang, this idea of building out a super app that can uh, do everything from help us invest, do our banking every day and so on. What are some of the features of that that you want to add over the next year? Uh, and what is there more to build in that platform? Well, if I may step back quickly on Paotang. Paotang was built on the spirit of uh, being an open platform. Uh, uh, for all ties, right? And, and with that, we focus in five ecosystem, which is um, first, the payment, which is the uh, basic activity for banking. Second, we select uh, the government. Uh, we believe the government itself is an ecosystem that connect to uh, both the public and private and citizens uh, sectors. Um, then uh, we, we, we look at the, um, also that everyone have to be concerned about the health and wellness. And the, um, also, uh, we talk about the education uh, system and also the mass transit. And this is what we uh, have uh, uh, consciously identified and, and select that we want to be deepening our penetration product and services into these five ecosystems. And when we do that, uh, uh, we, 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 we did that, we, we made that decision before the COVID come. And when the COVID come, um, the, uh, that open platform uh, with uh, 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 partnering with the uh, government ecosystem, uh, uh, such open platform happen to be very convenient uh, to facilitate the connectivity between the government ecosystem into uh, its customer, which means the, uh, the, all the citizens uh, who need uh, support, who need welfare, who need subsidy during the COVID, during the pandemic. Uh, so that was the, uh, 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 the thing that, that, that had uh, uh, basically, what I would say, uh, uh, be there in time uh, uh, for COVID. Uh, and once COVID happened, uh, such open platform has been used to facilitate such engagement. 
And when that happened, uh, uh, the challenge that we had is how do you connect the, uh, 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 how can you uh, drive digital connectivity uh, 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 to all ties uh, to begin with? Because you talk about uh, multi-segment and some of the segment, they don't even have what I would call the uh, ship card, uh, 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 citizen ID card. They still have the paper ID card. They don't have digital identification. Uh, how do you do that? You have to uh, ensure that uh, you mobilize your resources so that uh, you can connect the old world uh, and ensure that they come along, uh, bring them on board uh, from offline into online. And that requires uh, quite um, uh, uh, mobilization and collaboration between our resources and the, uh, and the government resources. And once they are digitally connected through digital ID, um, um, then uh, you can uh, consider about uh, financial inclusion, financial connectivity, uh, in order to, um, to, to involve them into, into the, uh, 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 the, um, uh, the service that you wanted to, to, for them to get the, uh, the welfare. So when we started with that, um, it, uh, because pandemic affected multi uh, 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 classes of the, uh, the citizens, so with that, um, we, we ended up connected uh, to over 40 million uh, Thai citizens uh, 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 toward digital ID uh, for the government. And when that happened, uh, the, the, the support, the help, the connectivity from the government can be very fast, very direct. So now we have these 40 million into our ecosystem. We also connect the dots by uh, supporting the small SME uh, in addition to what you mentioned, Pao Tang, which is for what I would, would call the, uh, uh, the, uh, the individual. Then we have another um, uh, 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 platform we call Thung Ngân. Thung Ngân means uh, the money back for, for merchants. We, we, we develop that uh, toward um, the objective of uh, serving the needs of small and medium SME who don't have uh, the traditional what we call EDC machine, right? So we, uh, but they do have mobile phones, so we can have the uh, uh, EDC uh, on mobile, right? And that, uh, we con that, with that, we connect the dots. So um, to long story short, uh, we have the citizen, the user of, of the uh, Bao Tang, which is the open platform, then you have the, uh, the merchants um, um, platform, the two are connected. So the next uh, focus on our side is to ensure that, uh, 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 it will um, deepening uh, the uh, trade activities um, uh, toward the SME uh, so that technology and digital can empower them uh, to uh, have a better business activities. So that's what we are aiming toward. Are you planning to acquire any tech firms to beef up your fintech business? Acquisition is one of the one 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 of an option, right? Um, a partnership uh, can 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 go through uh, many form, and, and and acquiring fintech is is just one of the one of the way. We do a lot of partnering. Should we expect to see any acquisitions over, say, the next twelve months? <laughs> partnerships, <laughs> we call partnerships. <laughs> so it depends. Uh, that that is always an option. And any plans to expand the business beyond Thailand? Um, yes, but in terms of um, specific to Krung Thai Bank, uh, we don't plan to do so um, yet. Uh, we, we believe that the world will be very connected. We believe in region, uh, regional connectivity. Uh, so uh, uh, we need to strengthen our footprint within Thailand. Uh, and once we strengthen that footprint, uh, our footprint should definitely be connected into the, uh, the regional footprint. And with digital technology, you can easily uh, connect and ensure the interoperability uh, that, that is there. And that is definitely the direction of the industry that we are moving toward. The whole industry is focusing now on in, uh, first building the, what I would call the common infrastructure or common utility. Uh, you've seen that, for example, like PromPay, right? Um, and and PromPay uh, for payment services in Thailand is free for all the retail, which is very different from other countries, and that is 
one of the accelerator or enabler uh, 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 toward the adoption uh, to use the uh, mobile payment. Uh, second, we, we, we are pushing as an industry toward what we call the um, regional connectivity, right? And, and that means that um, our platform, our services, we have to plug into uh, the regional activities, uh, just like what you heard, you've heard in the other session, right? And then once that, that is happening, then uh, the uh, 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 Thai um, uh, businesses uh, can be, again, through region uh, uh, collaboration, it can be uh, uh, connected to the world. What are some of the challenges for you as a bank when you think about building out those sort of transnational or regional links? You mean what does it mean? Well, what does it mean? We can start, let's start with what does it mean? And then, if you will, what some of the challenges are to achieving that successfully? Well, first, it is uh, collaboration uh, to what uh, 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 standardization, right? Uh, when you talk about standardization, well, I, I jump to standardization. First, you need to ensure connectivity, right? That um, the, the, the platform of, uh, of, of countries are, are connectable, right? And once it is connectable, then you, you have to ensure that it has uh, 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 standardization on how you um, um, uh, uh, take and send the data. Right, and uh, you have to ensure different standard that it is interoperable, right? So, so that connectivity means a lot of collaboration. Um, you, you've seen the earlier session we talk about the regional digital trade. Um, that means that you talk about the the the, the activities the bis uh, across businesses. You're talking about the regulations of two countries. You talk about like different uh, uh, custom rules uh, and rates. Um, um, you talk about uh, 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 different environments. So, so this thing has to be uh, uh, standardized and, and, and built up in terms of building blocks, right? And, and when that happens, uh, then you can connect regionally. And at the end, uh, you have to ensure on common goal because uh, everyone has to win toward that connectivity. So when you collaborate together, it's like one plus one is equal to five. Right. And once the, uh, the members, the, con the, the membering countries are convinced and, 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 and moving toward common goal, uh, this regional connectivity uh, uh, can enable the uh, even more prospering and inclusive growth. And like I mentioned earlier, once you apply digital uh, 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 enabler, uh, you have to uh, consider across different segments and uh, once you do that, um, then uh, when you connect with the regional uh, 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 membering countries, then uh, uh, citizens across membering countries can enjoy uh, these benefits. And they can I don't mean to cut you off, Leon, but we do actually have another special guest joining us, I think. So, Mr. Jason Chen is, is on his route at some point. Chairs are going to come first. joining us. Sorry for the late and thank you for having me here. Better late than never. Better late than never. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, we've, we've got a short time with both of you. I'm just going to ask, we'll get straight into it. All right. I know you've been thinking a lot about cybersecurity. You've come from the Leaders Summit. Geopolitical tensions are at possibly an all-time high or at least rising. What are you thinking about when it comes to cybersecurity? What is your number one concern? Um, there are multiple things. So let me start with... Let's start with just one. Just start with the importance of digitalization. And you know what? You guys already talked about that. However, I do want to talk about uh, digitalization will involve not just put things on computer. It's about changing process procedures. It's about changing business model like grabs. It's about enhancing competitiveness like banks. However, anything and everything that we are thinking about putting things on the computer, whether that's computer or IoT, the cybersecurity become a prerequisite. The risk of cybersecurity is getting higher and higher 
In fact, in our statistics shows the malicious cyber attack doubles every six months. Just think about that. I'm not trying to, he try to be here to scare people, but I'm, allow me to bring you the awareness and let's make sure that we all will prepare for that. That's my one minute. Thank you. Just over one minute, but we'll forgive you. Um, tell us, what do you do about that risk? There are a couple of things that we should be doing. Number one, uh, awareness. Number two, actions. Training people getting aware of uh, the importance so that do not open up phishing emails. Regularly doing scanning of weak point. In case anything happened, there's an SOP in place. In fact, we are here to advocate for the policy makers to put together a requirement for large corporations like you, yourself and many of your company staff. You need a cyber security officers that's in charge, that is with credentials, with the knowledge. And therefore, in case anything happened, before it happened, there are regular drill need to be done. And in case anything happened, there's an SOP. The people know what to do, not just unplug, not just shut down, but also finding what happened before reinstall the data. Or otherwise, many companies have experienced this. Is you shut it down, and you reformat your hard disk drive, and then you download your, your data again, and you know what? You got virus infection again. So just keep it back and forth, back and forth for weeks. And therefore, it's very important within the SOP that you will have to do a thing called finding what happened, the root cause. Root cause it before you reinstall your data. That's, so that's useful advice for some of your consumers, your retail consumers, and for companies like mine. What are you as a business doing? Uh, our business, uh, we do have one of our subsidiaries called Acer Cyber Security. Yes, I understand people know Acer as Acer Computer, but now we are more than just computer. We are now redefine the company's computer science. One of the area that we do is cyber security. So uh, Acer Cyber Security Inc is already a public listed company. We have about uh, 500 people doing uh, security operations. So we do watch all the data flows uh, among our clients uh, to make sure that in case anything happen, we are aware, we prevent it, to make sure that we build up, we build up depths for the defense. So that layer by layer, and therefore, regular data and highly sensitive data, they are secure in a different area. Heyong, where do you see the cybersecurity risks for banking when it comes to introducing digital infrastructure, digital programs? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, wow. <laughs> it is definitely the, uh, uh, something that you have to uh, be extremely mindful. Uh, if you uh, move toward digital economy, if you build anything up, uh, uh, the last thing you want is to lose your credibility and don't have trust uh, with your clients, with your stakeholders. So you have to be extremely, extremely resilient to the cyber risk. So every development that you do, you have to uh, build the, uh, uh, what uh, he just mentioned, the awareness. Uh, also, you have to uh, uh, ensure that you have a very well um, data security. Uh, the cyber security uh, uh, in place properly and uh, therefore um, it and again what, what he mentioned is that uh, well, Jason. Jason, Jason. <laughs> Thank you Mr. Chairman. <laughs> uh, before, uh, uh, before you get there right um, you have to um, uh, in addition to awareness uh, the bigger you are uh, the more uh, threat the more exposure you would have because you will by definition be the target uh, of these, uh, uh, what I would call the, um, the new, uh, uh, the, the, the cyber criminal. So that definitely has to be that. Uh, you talk about security, uh, you talk about reliability. When you talk about the, um, uh, 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 the cyber risk, not only uh, you touch upon the data leak, uh, data leakage, but you also talk about the, uh, the system could be down. 
right? So how do you build uh, uh, and be resilient toward this kind of risk, like what Jason mentioned? Yeah, and different level of security required. Banking data definitely is what paper people care one of the most. Uh, just think about the money you have in the bank in case all the data and the numbers get scrapped. So you temporarily, I don't know how long that will be, you lose your money. All the money you have is the money in your pocket. You can't withdraw money from your ATM. You can't uh, withdraw money. You cannot wire money in or out from your bank account. What do you feel? Disaster, end of life. No, that's not the worst. The worst is next will be public facility like grabs, like traffic lights. What if the subway will not run? What if the electricity will not run? What if your phone cannot call? All these what if are the highly sensitive, highly security required. And area. ESA has become increasingly involved in the Internet of Things. So how do you think about cybersecurity in that context when it comes to you know, driving your car, turning on your kettle at home? Exactly right. Because now more and more cars are using many semiconductors and lots of softwares. And guess what? Software need upgrades. So therefore, now, now almost every single car they are using over the air software up update. And the over-air software update will come with the risk of virus come with it, whether that's leaking, whether that's leaking your position, or creating problems for your car. Just think about it. I'm not trying to scare you, but there's always risk out there. And anything related to electronic, related to data, related to software, you just have to be careful uh, what's going on. And you have your phone with you, guess what? Even though you are not talking on the phone, as long as your phone is on, the microphone is actually listening. Who do you think is listening to you, Jason? So, so you decided to <laughs> turn it off on <laughs> or put it aside when you are having an uh, important conversation happening. Um, do you do that regularly? Do you turn off your phone because you're worried that... I am thinking to not to use phone that much. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> I did hear you were thinking about moving into mobile devices increasingly. So how do you think about enforcing some of those kind of security protocols and also dealing with this rising scrutiny, rising concern from consumers around these issues? Um, yes, it's not just us. It's your business is your business that uh, people will have to deal with and be aware daily. I think the awareness is most important. It's not the worry and the anxiety, it's the awareness and the behavior change. Make sure that whenever the pop-up of software update, you do have to do it. Don't just push it out. Say next time, or say delete, or say go away. No, no, no. Those pages are important. As a manufacturer, what responsibility do you have to protect your consumers around against things like this? Uh, there are multiple areas that we will have to do that regularly. Number one, regular backup for our system. Number two, regular drill. Number three, regular scanning for the weak point, so that we know what to do, and we train up our employee. And also, we do remind our customers what to be careful. OK, and, and Pyong, in, in your opening remarks, you commented on the increasingly uncertain world that, that we live in. Um, and I want to pick your brains a little bit. You, as, as heading up the Thai Banking Association, and in, in that role, um, uh, we're seeing rising inflation, relatively weak consumption, and tighter financial conditions. In that context, what are the challenges for digital infrastructure? Do you think there's a risk that that push slows down? Um, and how do you think the banking sector is dealing and thinking about this? I think the, uh, uh, all, all the banks are pretty much aware of, 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 of the challenges uh, ahead, uh, particularly in this kind of environment. Uh, in the tough environment, that means that you have to uh, be very disciplined in reallocating your resources 
when you're talking about uh, digital transformation, you talk about investment. Uh, when you talk about investment, you need resources. Uh, how you're going to come up with that resources, uh, that, that is the key that you have to be very mindful. And um, uh, it, it is something that uh, uh, many of the things you should not and cannot be uh, 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 doing it alone. You have to look at uh, as an industry. You have to look at as the ecosystem. You look at uh, have to look at in, in in terms of partnership and connectivity. So so the collaboration beyond banking, beyond banks, uh, uh, would be key uh, on the uh, uh, in, in this tough environment. But needless to say, uh, uh, we believe that. Um, uh, once the turbulence uh, in the next few years uh, uh, becomes uh, a settle or clearer, uh, which I don't know whether it's going to become clearer or not, <laughs> but uh, out when people talk about new economy or, 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 or uh, new normal or never normal uh, anymore, right? <laughs> so, uh, but, but having said that, uh, uh, means that you have to, to rush toward uh, transforming yourself, uh, change the way you do things, and be very careful and be very uh, discipline. Uh, when you talk about um, industry collaboration, you have to talk about uh, uh, focusing in building the what I would call common infrastructure, uh, common utility that the industry as a whole needs it, and it will be for the sake of all stakeholders uh, 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 around banking industry. So, so that will be our focus. Uh, on top of that, uh, in this difficult um, environment, you're talking about uh, if if you don't. Um, um, look at it across uh, 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 the uh, segment, uh, then some could be left out. So that has to be very careful that along the transformation, along the transition, how can you ensure uh, what I would call inclusive transformation? And without inclusive transformation, you can't have inclusive growth, you can't have inclusive uh, uh, prosperity, or you can't even have inclusive uh, uh, changes. So, so that will be uh, something that we have to watch out. When you talk about common utility, uh, you, you also have to look deeper uh, into uh, 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 particularly those who traditionally uh, have not been able to enjoy a privilege uh, uh, to the, uh, to, uh, to the uh, benefit of the digital technology. How can you include them? How can you uh, spare uh, the resources uh, to ensure that uh, uh, them as a whole is part of this uh, uh, transitory journey. And we, and, yep. Can I echo that? Yes. I think I got uh, some of the very good examples. Uh, smart solutions, uh, changing business models. Uh, recently, uh, actually not recently, in the past few years, as a group, we have been working on artificial intelligence based digital image diagnostic solutions, getting FDAs in ASEAN countries and, and try to assist medical doctors to bridge what we call it medical device, urban versus suburb versus villages. The medical infrastructure are not equal for that. We'll be able to help uh, people to get as good as a real medical specialist on site in a village for inclusive reason. Just to echo you. Yep. Thank you. Yep. And, and, and to add on, uh, Jason, um, I think. I should just walk off. <laughs> leave you both to it. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Please continue, Bill. Yep. The, uh, 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 the common infrastructure is something that we have to uh, ensure that there is no unnecessary redundancy. Right? Uh, you're talking about the resources, you're talking about the capital. Uh, and you're talking about the speed of this transformation. Uh, so that would be key. The, uh, the other thing that, that uh, we have to focus on is uh, the common area that we have to uh, uh, build, um, not only in terms of private sectors, but also the government sectors uh, that has to be involved. Uh, when you talk about the uh, underserved segment, you want to talk about uh, in inclusive growth, uh, you need what I would call added capital additional capital that needs to get into that segment. And it is definitely, uh, particularly in banking, when we are the traditionally intermediary, is about the engine that uh, uh, reallocate and redistribute capital uh, in the right way, in the most efficient manner. And in, in some of these uh, transition, uh, you may need support from the government, not only from the regulatory point of view, but also from the incentive uh, that needs to come in. 
uh, in the process of these changes. So once that is built, um, then you can talk about how each of the participant can enhance and extend uh, their expertise beyond this common utility. But the key is without this common utility or even how to deal with cyber risk, if every single one of us uh, wanted to build and invest in that, it's definitely is not effective, it's not efficient. Uh, so therefore, uh, uh, once the common infrastructure is there, then uh, the, the prosperity, the innovation uh, can be an added and extended version out of that uh, common infrastructure. The reality is though, there are less financial and there will be less financial resources going forward. We are facing increasing instability, liquidity all over the world is tightening. Do you think there's a risk that we fail to meet the issues and the demands from those underserved communities that we're talking about as companies, banks, everyone tightens their belt? Definitely. Um, even when you talk about digital inclusion, right? Um, it is, uh, if, if you go back and look at this morning when President Macron mentioned about the uh, capitalism, right? Are we talking about extreme capitalism or we're talking about inclusive capitalism, right? If you talk about inclusive capitalism, it's not about maximizing profit. How can you do that in the uh, private sector world? You have to look deepening into that. So you need probably incentive from the government, common direction from the industry uh, in order to do that. And what about, what does inclusive capitalism look like at Acer, Jason? We do look at uh, all kinds of opportunities. There's one thing that's very important that when the environment is changing, the biggest risk is actually not cybersecurity. The biggest risk is you do not change. What the external environment is changing, it's very important that people keep thinking about company changing. How do you transform your company to make sure that you accommodate the environment changes? And to do so, what's coming? What's new? Esports, for instance. E-banking, for instance. Micro mortgage, for instance. Um, sharing economy, for instance. Those are all new emerging business model or ideas or initiatives. Let's make sure that we fully capitalize those innovations and make them to be real business and scale them up to the level that you will be able to stand up by its own two legs. Then there will be more opportunity open up, offer it to whether they are served or underserved people, because we believe people are equally, equally, almost similar intelligence. What is different is the opportunity being offered. We would like to use the new innovations to offer new opportunity to people. A good example for my company, when I joined Acer nine years ago, was one single company. Now we have many initiatives, and among them, 10 are already IPO. Now we, within the company, we have 10 CEOs and 10 chairmen. Think about that. 10 years ago, they are directors, they are managers, they are my technical assistants. Now they are CEOs and they are chairmen. That's what and how we make more opportunities for people coming and emerging. Thank you. I want to touch just on the other side of the coin there. You have more than 160 firms across the world, and so geopolitic, geopolitics sort of intimately affects your business. Um, I, b before we let you go, I, I do want to ask, how are chip sanctions affecting your business, and what are you preparing for? Uh, the sanction is not just chips, but <laughs> sanction is in multiple fronts. Yes. It, does affect our business. We do have to follow rules, regulations, and laws on sanctions to make sure that uh, we are a good corporate citizens. Uh, therefore, uh, the areas and the technology that we will be able to do full speed, we will. And the area that we will have to cut back, we should, to make sure that we follow the rule and we are good. 
for our CSR uh, responsibility. What sort of industries, what other parts of your business model is changing as a result? Uh, a good example would be it, uh, for certain areas and certain countries that uh, we won't be able to sell our high-end product. Uh, however, uh, for the rest, we still run the fast as, as fast as we can. Okay, I, I want to turn this to a little bit more of a positive note as we, as we finish up. I know it's been a long day for, for both of you. Uh, everyone. For everyone, indeed. Um, so, just in 30 seconds or less, what do you think, what is your vision of digital infrastructure over the next five years? What do you think will be the defining characteristics? Uh, I would see people will try to digitize as much as possible in a way that is secure your data, not just for privacy, but for business reasons so that people will improve their productivity, the GDP, the economic will be better enhanced. At the same time, people will enjoy their life better. Thank you. Young. Um, on top of Jason, um, uh, you have to ensure uh, trust and confidence uh, and, 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 and the security uh, around the digital activities as part of your life. And with that, uh, the digital technology, uh, 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 just like what Jason mentioned earlier, let be clear, it is an enabler. It's not the mean to the end. So how you make use of it uh, is, 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 is very critical. You have to be very clear with certain objective. Uh, our objective is that uh, the digital technology in my business, banking and services, will enab enable and empowering a better life uh, 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 for clients around us, for stakeholders around, uh, around us. That is definitely a purpose. If they cannot feel uh, the better life, if they cannot feel uh, uh, what benefit they're going to get, uh, then uh, 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 there will be a lack of willingness to change, as what Jason mentioned earlier. So with that, in every transformation that you do, uh, uh, we must ensure uh, the inclusive consideration uh, and with all stakeholders and the key is uh, you must reallocate resources, uh, whether it comes from the government or it comes from the industry, it must be recognized as a necessity. And with that, uh, the objective is that with the digital transformation, uh, it will uplift the economy and the life of the society and the people around it uh, to the next level. Thank you. Perfect end. Thank you so much. Security, empowerment, we're all going to live a better life. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. It's been an absolute pleasure.